So last week, um, we put up a series of slides downstairs. And it's, this is the slide that says, following Christ is a wild adventure full of risk, frustration, excitement, and setbacks. It is not an evening stroll in a planned community along a well-manicured path. The Holy Spirit does not like me because I said last week, this is the one that I love. And so the Holy Spirit visited it on me this week. I'm going to set you back a little bit here. I'm going to set you back this week because you forgot something fundamental last week when you were talking about risk. You forgot, and I'm going to remind you of it. Tap, tap, tap. Get up and speak this message. It was, I don't know, 1130 at night, and I'm laying in bed, and I feel this physical tap on my head. Tap, tap, tap. Get up and speak this message. I'm like, no, I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. Don't make me come down there. Get up and speak this message. So I get up out of bed, and I'm standing up, and I'm like, what? And I never believe of speaking in tongues ever, but I'm telling you, I stood there looking at my wall, saying the things that I think the Holy Spirit wants me to say today. Because that afternoon, you see, the Holy Spirit had shown me a sermon by the president of the Chicago Theological Seminary, Dr. Stephen Ray, and he was speaking to the Illinois Conference of the United Church of Christ. I don't say that right. I'm supposed to say it like this. The Illinois Conference of the United Church of Christ. I'm supposed to say it like that. I never say that right. But he was speaking to the Illinois Conference United Church of Christ about the thriving uh, ministries for the pastors that are going into this coaching situations that we're going to be having here, helping churches revitalize and strengthen themselves. And he started talking about how we had gotten stuff wrong for all of this millennia. We had gotten stuff wrong because the way we live our lives is always looking for where God's hand is in the world. And he says we spend so much time looking for where God's hand is, we get distracted that God is in the world. Because we're busy looking for God. We're looking, turning over stones. We're trying to find where God is at. And he said what that leads us to do is to do this, distract and not see the world as it is. And we get into this mindset of we want the world to be what it was back there, right? What was it back there that we like so much that we want to pull forward? Or we get distracted by, we want the world to be out there. And so we look out there, where is God out there calling us? And Dr. Ray put it so simply in ways that it just had never occurred to me before. He said, here's the problem with Christianity. We ask the wrong questions. We should not be asking the questions of how is it going to be this way? How can it be like it used to be? We should be asking ourselves, what is the world today? What is it like today? We don't ask ourselves ever to see the world as it is because we're so busy looking for God to do all of the work that that we miss in our midst that God is doing the work. And that our job as Christians is to say to God, okay, you're doing it. Tell us how we can help you. Show us what we can do. And he said, and here's the sermon that you never, ever hear in any church. You are living in a world that is becoming extinct. You are living in a world that is dying more rapidly than we would hope. You are living in a world that soon, within the next 200 years, is probably going to be extinct if Christians don't start doing what it is that God asks them to do. And what it is that God asks them to do is to participate in giving life with God to a world where death is trying to have the last world. He said, you see, death wants the last word, always. 
dying wants to be the final end note. And what God has been trying to tell us for all these millennia is death will not have the last word. Love and life will have the last word in this world. But Christians have not yet figured that out. They just keep, where is God? Where is God? Where is God? Where is God? Instead of realizing that God is right here, right now, the world is dying, and God is screaming at us in our faces to say, help me give life to the world. Help me build life. Get past the fact that you want it to be this way, that you wish it was that way, and see it as it is. It is dying. And if we don't start breathing life into the world, then what is going to happen to us is death. And that's not the way that God wants it. I could stop right there. I could stop right there, but if I stop right there, you know what it's going to do? It's going to take some responsibility off of our shoulders. Because I then began to think about what does Dr. Ray's words about how death is trying to kill us, kill the world, and God is trying to save us and give us life, what does that have to do with what we talked about last week downstairs around the table about where we are and where we want to go and how are we going to get there. Steve, that would be the next slide, I think. Remember, this is on the front of your bulletin. Remember, last week we were talking about what are we going to risk for God? How are we going to risk for God? Where are we? Where do we want to go as the community at St. Paul United Church of Christ? And how are we going to get there? And we talked about are we ready to risk This is where the Holy Spirit comes into the story. Because as the Holy Spirit came into the story and tried to start illuminating for me how Dr. Ray's words about how we are participating in death rather than participating with life, with God, came to me, I began to understand. I asked the wrong question last week. I asked the question, what are you willing to risk for God? But the question that I should have been asking is, where are you? Where are you in the midst of this life-giving thing? Where am I in the midst of this life-giving thing that God is asking us to do? Because we are a collective. We sometimes think only in the collective. What are we doing together? But the collective is made up of individuals, you see. And the individual who comes to the collective, the individuals who are in the collective, have to be in the journey with God about giving life in this world, about doing the things that God calls each one of us to do that will breathe life into this world where death is trying to have the last word. And I remembered the words of my friend, the Reverend Dr. Pamela Leitze. You have heard me say these words many times because what she says is so profound. The words of the Reverend Dr. Pamela Leitze are, you white folks because she's African-American, you white folks are always worried about numbers, attendance numbers. How many are we getting through the door? How much money do we have? How many people came to that program? I don't understand that language, she told a group of us that were with her. All of us white, Pamela, African-American. She says, the black church doesn't talk that way. The black church says, how are you connecting to Christ How are you working with Christ and how is that helping the world? And, you know, Pamela's about this high. She's got a diastema and she's very cool. I mean, she's just cool. And she goes, and she turns and looks at us. She says, you know, all you white folks, if you'd start asking the right questions, you wouldn't have to be worrying about attendance numbers or budget numbers. If your people, she said, if your people are right with God. All of that stuff gets taken care of because that's life-giving for the people to be right with the Holy Spirit, to be in the groove, as they say, with the Holy Spirit. All those numbers take care of themselves when the people are in the midst of the life 
life-giving force of the Holy Spirit and taking that life-giving force we're given and giving it away. 12.30 at night, I'm, te- I'm saying this to the walls of my house. And I'm hoping to myself, oh my God, I hope Steve doesn't wake up because he's got to be up to go to work in about five hours. But it was so profound I didn't sleep that I had asked the wrong question. I asked you what you're ready to risk, but I hadn't asked you where are you in the midst of that. You see, I put the cart before the horse. I can ask you what you want to risk, and if you're not right with God, if I'm not right with God, if somebody asks me that question, what happens? It falls apart. Where we are at as a collective is all of us needing to look at where we are as individuals in our relationship to Christ. And some of us, very much like the parable that Jesus is talking about, we might find that our relationship is on sinking sand with Christ. We might find that we're doing this thing back and forth with Jesus because, guess what, we're not built on the bedrock that is Jesus Christ. You know why? Anybody got a guess why? Because it's not going to be a well plant, a well, a, a nighttime walk through a well planned community that is all taken care of. We would rather do the shifting thing and say, "Well, we want it to be the way we want it to be." Jesus, Jesus, please do it my way. Don't ask me to do it your way. Can you begin to understand how people like Dr. Ray, who is also African American, and Dr. Lightsey, would say to us? White folks, you're asking the wrong questions. You need to be asking the questions about your relationship with God and where you're at in the midst of your relationship with God before you can ask anything else about what the collective is going to do. Are you right with God? Some of us might find ourselves with our lives in shambles right now. Everything in the world is falling apart, just like Nehemiah when he looked at Jerusalem after it had been ransacked. He looks at Jerusalem and it is totally, totally devastated. And yet God had placed upon his heart, he says, what the, I didn't tell anybody what the Lord had placed on my heart. And what the Lord had placed on my heart was to build that city again. And I'll tell you that the scripture that comes immediately after what Heather read this morning in Nehemiah says that when he shared it with people, they tried to stop him. Anybody ever been in one of those places where you're feeling the power of the Holy Spirit on your heart? God is telling you what it is you're supposed to be doing, and all of a sudden they go, "Ah, we can't do that. We cannot build that because we don't have enough money. We cannot do that because that's crazy. Please stop saying the word Holy Spirit to me. Anybody ever had anybody say to them, please stop saying the word Holy Spirit to me? I have. Do not talk like those evangelicals, Jenna. You are in a mainline Christian denomination. We don't want to hear no Jesus language. Charlotte Dreher would sit right there and every day she would say to me, I love it when you say the word Jesus. I got that from Robert Duvall. I can't claim that on my own. (laughs) Got that from Robert Duvall, who says, today I am a Holy Ghost-filled preaching machine, right? I've been told in the mainline denominations when I'm feeling the power of the Holy Spirit in my heart, calm down, Jenna. We're not supposed to be acting that way. We are white people. Stop. You think I'm fibbing with you? very powerful 40-year pastor once said to me, you, stop trying to be black. I came here. I got an anonymous note. I just love those anonymous notes in the mailbox. Somebody put an anonymous note in my mailbox, and it says, Jenna, stop trying to make us Willow Creek. Okay. We don't have a snowball's chance of being Willow Creek. <laughs> Can I just tell you that? I'm going re- to reframe that. We do have a snowball's chance if we let the Holy Spirit help us do it. Right? We could be Willow Creek East. Anybody been in one of those places 
where the Lord has placed something on your heart that seems so unbelievably difficult to do. And yet you know that you are in the groove. You know that you are in the midst of the Holy Spirit power of this world. You know that you are right with God in those moments. And you've allowed yourself to be stopped because it's frightening. Anybody been there? Anybody been there? I asked you the wrong question last week. I asked you what you're ready to risk. And if you don't know where you're at with God, you don't know what you're ready to risk. You don't know where you are and how you're going to get there if you don't know what your relationship with God is. None of us do. And on any given day, all of us are in different places with God. You know, I always say, you know, God is supposed to be first because the first commandment is you will have nothing between you and God. I fail at that every day. I wake up in the morning and I know people that get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and they do these devotional things and they spend their time with Jesus. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm saying to Steve, don't make noise. (laughs) I want to sleep some more. I fail at that God first thing. But if we are ever to be the collective communal of faith, community here, that God wants us to be going where God needs us to be, working in life-giving, transformative ways with God, then perhaps maybe we got to go back to the basics and figure out where we're at down here when it comes to where is God in our lives? Where is God in our life? For each one of us. Because that really gives us a measure of where God is in our communal life. And if God is not first in our communal life, guess what we are doing? Anybody got an idea? If God is not first in our communal life, what are we doing? Idolatry. You are such a good disciple student. We are building a tower unto ourselves. The first hymn was, come build a church of soul and spirit. We don't need a church of tower and wood and glass. If God is not first in our life, we're focused on the wood and the tower and the glass. If God is not first in our lives, individually and collectively together, then what we're doing is we're building a country club, not a church. And I don't know about you, but I was not called to build a country club where preferences rule over uh, principles, where what we like is more important than what we can do, that what we covet is more important than what needs to be changed. I wasn't called to do that, and I don't think everybody in here was called to do that either. But as we move forward in this path of how we're going to rise up and build with God, how we're going to go from where we are as a community of faith to where we want to go, where we think God is calling us, and how we're going to connect those two things, I think it is incumbent upon us to say the world is dying. The world as it is is a place where death is, and where am I in the midst of that with God? And am I contributing to the death or am I contributing to the life? Because God will never call us to die in that way. God might call us to die toward those things that cause us from being in life. But the one already died, the main death, so that we had the privilege to do this life thing. Where are we when it comes to where we're at with God. What are we going to do? How are we going to get there? So before we go any farther, I want you to do a gut check. Was God the first thing on your mind this morning? You don't have to tell me. Was God the first thing on your mind this morning? Or was the first thing on your mind this morning was, what do I need to eat? How do I, what, how, do I want to go to church? I don't know if I want to go to church. Do I want to go to church? There's five Sundays this month. I could get away with being gone, one of them. Was God the first thing on your mind this morning when you got up and said, thank you for the breath that you have 
given to me, God? Was God the first thing? Did you wake up and say, breathe on me, breath of God, and fill me with life anew this day? And show me how to be a vessel of life anew. I would venture to bet if I was a betting person, no. Some of us, yes, maybe. Some of us, yes, maybe. People that are good at those devotion things. Yes, maybe. But I would bet that the majority of us, even myself, the first thing that was on my mind this morning is what I was worried about that needed to get done. And those things that I needed to get done do not give me life. They don't give anybody life because worries do not give life. Worries are soul killing, dying things. So perhaps before we can even move forward, what we have to do, I'll say it again, is we each individually have to figure out where we are with God. And that might be pain-filled. Because guess what? You might have to change. You might have to be different tomorrow. If you're going to truly put God first in your life and you're going to be on that life-giving journey with God, you might have to be different tomorrow than you are today. And you might have to be different on Tuesday than you are on Monday. And you might have to be a completely different person next Sunday when you come here than you are today. And sometimes, more often than not, that is going to be hard. What's the quote? It's going to be an adventure that's going to be frustrating, exciting, and yet still difficult. If we want to move together as a collective, the first thing we need to do is get our house in order and make sure that our house is built with the people, the walls of the house, we, the walls of the house, being straight with God. So my challenge to you this week is to go home and think about that. Where are you in the midst of the Holy Spirit and God? Where are you with God? Are you trusting what God's placing on your heart? Or are you telling God, don't bother me, I got stuff to do today. Are you open to God saying, I want you to go over there and give life to this person. I want you to take that and give life. I want you to go there. Or are you saying, wait, I got some death things I got to worry about today. I got to worry about how my bills are going to get paid. I got to worry about when I'm going to get to the grocery store. I got to worry about how I'm going to get to work. Because every time, as Dr. Ray would say, Every time the answer is to be, I want to be in life with you, God. I want to be in the game of life with you, God. I do not want to contribute to death. And if we take that seriously, guess what we're all going to find out? Every problem that we have is a spiritual one. That's a completely different sermon. That is, it's a completely different sermon. I know you all are getting tired of listening to me, but here's the thing. If we truly examine where we're at in the midst of life, giving with God, we are going to find out that every problem that we have is a spiritual problem. Money worries, spiritual problem. War, spiritual problem. Children in cages, spiritual problem. Homophobia, spiritual problem. Racism, spiritual problem. Ad nauseum, spiritual problem. Not political, spiritual and if we give in to those problems without the power of the Holy Spirit on our side, guess what we're doing? Creating death. And we are called to create life. So I need to go home and examine my own house. How strong is my own house when it comes to me adding it to the collective so that the collective can be as strong as possible? And we all need to do that so that we can be the church that God needs us to be in this place, in this time, for the world as it is. Amen.